Hey guys, welcome to Overcrest. We have a fun episode for you guys today. Dan Eaton is coming on the podcast. He's a locksmith and also a musician. We're going to talk a little bit about both. I think there's something really interesting about someone that has the power to pretty much go whatever they want and do whatever they want when it comes to uh, getting into places that they shouldn't be, yet they never do. Uh, Dan was a locksmith in one of the most dangerous areas of Illinois, and he's got some stories to tell. Thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for downloading this episode. Thank you for your support. And if you want to support this podcast a little bit more, overcrestproductions.com slash drivers club for five bucks, you can support this content. FC Piero is an online retailer of OE, OEM, genuine aftermarket and performance parts for European cars. From BMW to Porsche, Volvo, and more, their catalog is a one-stop shop with over 275,000 unique products, including expert assembled kits to make shopping simpler. Actively building out the VW, Audi, and Porsche catalogs from current to our favorite classics. They're including the Mark 1 Scirocco, which is our free ride car. They are working to have every part you need for all of your cars. Plus, every product they sell is backed by a lifetime replacement guarantee. No joke, you can send back your wear items like wiper blades, brake pads, oil filters, and even your used oil. With the opening of their distribution center in Mesa, Arizona, FC Piero is now shipping parts from both coasts, serving most of the country in just three days or less with free shipping. We at Overcrest have been working with FC Piero for years and can vouch for them. Real people who are passionate about what they do and the cars we love, while making sure that they put you, the customer, first. Check them out today at fcpeuro.com and take advantage of free shipping on any order over $49. What's going on, man? What's up, buddy? Just uh, living the life. I can't go on with uh, without checking out your guitars in the background. Okay. And I feel pretty cool right now <laughs> because I think it's the same the same guitar that I've got right here. If no, that's it's a, not quite. Those Jackson are those Kelly. are Explorers, aren't they? Yeah, that's you've got a, Gibson Explorers back there. That's a Gibson Explorer with EMGs, by the way. That's yep. my like Swedish death metal special. So like giant strings and tuned to c standard and then the les paul in the back is actually an edwards les paul those are made those are made in japan by esp guitars and i'll put that i'll put that up against any actual gibson les paul custom ever and it was like a thousand bucks you want to know something sad sick look at look at this i mean the dust man the dust is I haven't picked this guitar. This is the first time I've held this guitar in probably, I'm going to say 10 years. No, this shit. is the first time this guitar has been in my hand in 10 years. Got to get after it, dude. I know, dude, my, it's like, my fingers hurt. And then, <laughs> this is, uh, this was my guitar from when I was a kid. This was the first guitar I ever had was right here. And you can see what's missing on this guitar which was my EMG 81 12 volt powered uh, 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 pickup. It's not there. The, so the greatest this is, pickup uh, of all time. And I'll fight anyone that says otherwise. It is. It is the greatest pickup. I moved it from guitar to guitar to guitar. This as a kid was an absolute nightmare. And what I'm showing here is the Floyd Rose uh-huh. Tremolo bar. This sucked to have as a kid, especially when all these are stripped out. And I had uh-huh. to put, I had to put super glue in them. I'd have to, I'd have to get it tuned and then I would put super glue in the threads to get these things from like backing out and doing oh, weird sure. shit. They're all bent and fucked up. This guitar's toast. I don't think I mean I'm sure it could be repaired, but yeah. yeah, this is uh this is the pride and joy. You can actually I don't know if you'll be able to see you can see kind of like some paint markings on it. Mm-hmm. Totally. This right here says A B. Under underneath here is like rainbow paint. I had uh I had two girls that I thought were really cute. <laughs> um and uh they painted rainbow i said hey paint my guitar it'll be dope so one girl painted the front of the guitar yeah. and the other girl painted the uh the back of the guitar and then at some point i'm like ah that's that's super lame that's not metal <laughs> at, all, at all so that i then i painted over it it looks like uh there's a case down to my right it'd be annoying to dig out at this point but i have a usa jackson soloist down there that's flat black very similar right floyd on. rose flat black super strat emgs um, I just got that three months ago, I think. And that thing just, that thing rips. I've got, uh, this is right here. This is one my wife got me. 
Oh, that's that. beautiful, man. It looked black hanging it's, on the wall. Yeah, it's uh yeah. The finish is literally called Ruby Slipper. It's a a Sully brand guitar. Yeah, that's uh, rad. It's uh used to be a one man operation out of Texas, and he's since he's doing production guitars in Korea now. So John Sullivan that makes those, and he is the sweetest, most handsome man in the music industry. So <laughs> I don't know. Look at look at look at you. Look at you. Oh, geez. um, dude, I had a. I remember taking that guitar. So our you probably had a band space. You've been playing long enough that you probably mm -hmm. played when you were you know, like a teenager and stuff mm -hmm. like that. What was your band space like when so, you were playing? Uh, our first one was in a house on the second floor in Rockford, Illinois on Avon street. And anybody that knows Rockford will hear Avon street and cringe. That's it's arguably the worst neighborhood in Rockford, which is already okay. a rough city. And we were the, everybody kind of let us be cause we were the only like crazy white guys in the neighborhood. We were that crazy death metal band that played in the neighborhood. Yeah. I had like an eight inch jet black Mohawk at the time. We'd nice. be out front smoking cigarettes and pounding beers and people like people in the neighborhood would drive by, like stay away from those guys. There's something going on with those guys. <laughs> and then <laughs> when the band kind of started getting going, we got, we were basically given free reign of an abandoned, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say abandoned. It was a family member of the drummer that owned it, but it was a, uh, like we'll say two and a half story Victorian house. Okay. It had no running water. <laughs> um, and uh we practiced in the basement and it was a dirt floor limestone walled basement with no bathroom no running water there was a hole in part of the floor the one little concrete patch there was a hole maybe eight inches around and we didn't know where it went and that was the urinal we're like it's going somewhere like it's gone that's it's, all that we, it's we not care filling about. up so, yeah it's been, exactly. i mean there's been so, a lot of beers poured down this thing i mean so that was the that was the kind of the headquarters for that band that's the band i toured with and went all over the place with um and then here in santa barbara i was in a hardcore band and we were just renting regular band spots that wasn't anything really to write home yeah about, so yeah for us it was always somebody's basement man otherwise yeah. we had my grandpa got in trade he had a 40 conaline van that i went on many road trips and i can remember it was blue and it had like the the hubcaps it had a tire on the back Mm -hmm. that some dude rear at i remember we were in kansas we were on the turnpike and we were driving and so i just i remember being a little kid no seatbelts or anything back mm -hmm. then i'm just back in the back seat drawing and i got we hit something and i just got thrown into the other seat and then dropped onto the floor someone had rear ended us whatever oh, shoot. i remember this dude like walking up to the door just his face was all bloody because he didn't have his seatbelt on and he hit the van anyway so the van got back and my grandpa didn't want the van anymore so he traded it for basically like uh like a box truck as you imagine, like an old, probably early, eh, late 80s, mid 80s box truck, like mm -hmm. a UPS truck. And he traded the, the vans. One day the van was gone. And the next day this other truck showed up. And this truck was around for a couple of years, never really did anything. And it kept just getting farther away from the driveway. Like it was mm -hmm. in the driveway. Then it was behind the garage. <laughs> and it was next to the garage. And I think grandma just didn't want to see it. And yeah. so it just kept getting farther away. And then it was behind the shed which is 50 yards away from the house. It was, it so was what, one step from being the shed. It was, it, yeah, it was, well, it was past <laughs> the shed. It was demoted shed. It was demoted shed. It was like, it was, it was in the, so we, we, we was, uh, if my buddies couldn't play at their places, we, if we had to play at my place, like the, the basement was always a disaster. There was nowhere to play in the house. Not possible. So why don't we just play in the, in the, in the truck? Why don't we just play in the truck? So we, okay. we had every, every extension cord, possible just these super ratty grandpa extension cords with like the frayed stuff coming out uh -huh. plugged in like 10 of them like daisy chain together all oh the way gosh. out to this truck and we we would put like a power strip in there and my buddy would jam his drum set in the corner and then we'd have two guitars and a bassist and we we didn't have a vocalist or anything we yeah. were just jamming right Basically we were standing on top of each other we're standing on top of each other i had a i had a custom uh set up for my guitar it was a it was tall it was at least six well i don't know i was a kid so maybe it was five or six feet tall puffy black and it had yeah. a big white horn on it that had a switch so you could turn the horn on and off oh my god and it had I remember a big those. Head. it was like the custom they called it tuck and roll that was that yeah like, it looked like yeah. uh 
It looked like vinyl seating out of an 83 S10. It was uh yeah, yeah. bondage was an amp. It, it, it looked it looked like that because if you touched it, it would it would electrocute you. Uh huh. Because yeah, it wasn't grounded, probably because we had like 50 extension cords yeah, yeah. going God's knows where. That'll so every it. time you would touch it, the the horn was loud. I mean, you would turn the horn on and just blast the trouble. And you want that sometimes, then you turn it off because your ears were bleeding. Anyway, yeah. so we're all I, I'm surprised I can hear anything right now. Same. Because we were in this in this box truck with just everything turned all the way up just all the time all mm -hmm. the way up all the time and we're just jamming back they're always just playing metallica or megadeth or slayer or whatever you know just just crushing in the back of this in the back of this van and we had uh we had porn all over the walls like we, we any anything we would find like playboys swimsuits sports right. illustrated yeah, everything yeah. if there was a girl wearing not regular clothes or no clothes at all she was on the wall and i remember one time my grandma brought us water and uh <laughs> she comes with the picture and just like just pretended she didn't even see it and just brought this little picture of water like, like okay yeah all right yeah. good job that was yeah. our that was our band space <laughs> man we never really did anything <laughs> yeah we never really did we didn't really do anything with it i ended up um getting into music more in in college and stuff but i think the last I wrote an, I had an album that I wrote an acoustic one that I did that ended up going on college radio. And that's as oh, far cool. as ever went, it went for me. And I wrote a song for my wife, like a happy song. And then once I got married, I never played again because I was happy as shit. You know, yeah. my wife made me happy and life was good. And I wasn't music was an outlet for me, probably with a lot. I looking back on it, it was an escape, you yeah. know, playing guitar. I had a kind that's of totally. a interesting upbringing. So that was something that I think, I remember playing and when you're playing, all you're thinking about is playing. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, well, let's say it's a meditative, it it's a meditative activity. It's like when I lived in SF, I used to ride a fixed gear bike all over the place. And when I would get off work, I would blast down Goff street, which is like one of the busiest one ways in the city. And I would go full blast down Goff street at five o'clock at night in rush hour, just because yep. that was my, like, I'm shutting my brain off. I'm doing this one activity. Um, I totally understand. I still do that when I'm writing music here, or if I'm not feeling particularly creative, I'll just throw on a song. I know how to play inside out and backwards and just try to play it as best as I can. And I completely understand. I think I'm one of the reasons I, I still do that. So what is, when were you in San Francisco circa when, uh, 2013 to 2016. Okay. So that was way after me. I went, I went to college there way earlier that like 10 years, mm -hmm. 10 years prior to that. Yeah. So I kind of quit about the same time as my wife. She was up there for shoot 13 or 14 years before we moved down here so she was up there okay. a long time i had everything taken away from me as punishment when i was probably 16 mm -hmm. and i had a son dual 12 amplifier and i had uh i had another guitar i don't i don't even remember what it was and it got taken away from me i got grounded so mm -hmm. i got my music taken away mm -hmm. and which was a huge mistake as a parent i think yeah. that was oh, just dude. that that it, was not the thing to do been there um I, it I, just that's how I wound up where I am in life now. That was, I got kicked out of the house at 18 for getting my lip pierced. And no. that was actually kind of roundabout way how I wound up becoming a locksmith and afforded me the opportunities to be where I am now. Well, let's, let's talk about that. Like how let's, okay. so you got, tell me about deciding. Let's start there. Okay. Why did you get your lip pierced? Um, thought it was cool. I have no, <laughs> there's no deeper meaning to it. Like, okay. It reminds me of like the, the tattoo artists that I enjoy now are, purely decorative people say what is the meaning of that and i'm like looks cool and i like it that's all i care about. So, <laughs> um, and, uh, there's there's none and uh um yeah i got it pierced when i was yeah i was 18 dad saw it immediately kicked me out of the house and i was I, I was already working at the lock shop at that time but basically went bet and had my own apartment about four days later moved was out. that your first job locksmith uh first real job I mean, I did tasseled okay. corn when I was in junior high and uh, a couple summers in high school. I worked maintenance at a um, water park, Magic Waters. Shout out Magic Waters, Rockford, Illinois. <laughs> and uh, and uh, worked, uh, I should say, one and three quarters summers because I got fired on purpose. And uh, that was a terrible job. How, how'd you get fired? Um, so before we could leave at the end of the day, we had to do a sweep of the park and pick up all the garbage. You know, the little, uh, the little, the little folding like dust bins and a tiny brain. Oh yeah. 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 Yep. So yep. we had to go through the whole park and get every bit of garbage before we could clock out for the day. And for whatever reason, uh, 
there was only myself and two other people working for our department that day. So it was three of us to clean the whole park. And we were cruising along doing our thing. And at one point I looked up and saw the other two people sitting on a bench talking to each other. <laughs> and I blew my top. I just yeah. started cussing and swearing. I was 17 at the time and had no self-control, barely less than I do now. And uh started cussing and swearing and freaking out and not realizing that there were still people and families filtering their way out of the park. Oh, good. And yeah. uh, a dad said, a dad had some choice words for me and I had just decided I was kind of done at that point and turned and just yelled, fuck you at him. And yeah. <laughs> saw Why him not? make a be beeline to the customer services counter. And I just went, you know what? I don't work here anymore. And just that young man it. over there. Yeah. <laughs> walked right, back. That, yes. That one. Walked With back to our guy, shop. He's going to get a lip ring. I can tell. <laughs> get him out of here. <laughs> that guy with the Mohawk and the camo shorts and the Chuck Taylors. He was rude. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, if so you think I, uh, if you're if you have a family establishment like an amusement park, if the guy that comes with the job application, I don't care what his handwriting looks like, if he's got a mohawk, camo pants, and Chuck Taylors, he's probably at some point going to tell somebody to fuck up. Yeah, that's a guy that it's loves Pantera. So inevitable, <laughs> it's coming. It's, it's inevitable. It, it, it is inevitable. So, right, so you got the lip ring. They how like. How do you get kicked out for that? Seems like uh, more like a final straw kind of thing than the... no. It was my. I mean, I was barely. I barely got through high school. I was. I was kind of a nightmare, to be honest. I had uh, undiagnosed ADHD, uh, which in the house just meant I was lazy and didn't want to do work. Um, I didn't find that out until I was in my mid twenties. Uh, so, and then I mean. Not to throw anybody under the bus. I mean, me and my dad are like best friends now, but he kind of ran the house like a dictatorship at the time. Um, we're good now, you know. Years of therapy. Is that how he was raised, or is it I, uh, product I, of his I own don't environment? Know. I've I've heard rumors that my grandfather could be that way. He was sure. always fucking awesome to me. Like we were thick as thieves. Uh, we were we were. I was I was almost closer to him than I was with my own parents. I mean, my, uh, my so. dad took me into my grandpa's basement one time. And I, he's like, I want to show you something. Cause my grandpa was awesome. My dad and I go in and out, but my grandpa was always really awesome to me. You know, he mm -hmm. raised me partially. My dad also raised me, but my grandpa partially raised me, but my dad takes me basically. He's like, I want to show you something. And he pulls out this paddle and it's just like a, it's like this long. It almost looks like a, like a cricket mallet or something. Mm -hmm. And it has all kinds of holes hand drilled in it. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he drilled these holes in it when he realized he couldn't swing it fast enough. <laughs> for aerodynamics. <laughs> for aerodynamics. So Holy he could cow. Smack his ass even harder. See, that's the thing. My so, dad never beat me, but there was a lot of, it was, it was rough. That's yeah, it was rough. And, it uh, was rough. so was it a relief when he was like, get out and you're like, yes, the lip. Yeah, kind of. So did it yeah, for me. I mean, not at the time. It was stressful at the time. Cause I didn't know, you know, where I was going to go or what I was going to do. And, um, you know, he said, take it out or move out. And then it was, I think it was about four days later. I had my own apartment lined up, um, through a family friend and it was a little one bedroom, tiny, you know, uh, it was tiny. It was, it was basically a closet above a dirt floor basement infested with centipedes, but it was 250 bucks a month. <laughs> and, uh, so, um, and did it have running water? It did. It did. There it you go, two, man. It actually, ironically had too much running water. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've had so, some places uh, like that, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, you know, that's kind of like why I joke. I still have a nose ring and I still have my, my ears are gauged out a bit. Yeah. I mean, not as big as they used to, if they still are. Cause like, not to, not to be this guy, but like my life fucking rules now. And I still look like a, you know, I'm 40 years old wearing metal band t-shirts and piercings and, you know, well, just because you so. overcome things doesn't mean you have to, change who you are That's you're it. still that person yeah aggressive still, it's still you all right so uh, you became a locksmith how does mm -hmm. this happen nobody i don't think anybody graduates from high school and, go, and goes and looks for a locksmith job so that's a running it's, joke in the industry that no one becomes a locksmith on purpose right it's <laughs> so, always got to be an accident there's yeah. no way so, like i, can I think uh, of a lot of jobs like i think well, maybe like lumberjack um I think there's there's got to be a bunch of jobs that are just like accidental jobs. Yeah. Ice cream got like the guy that sells ice cream out of the truck. That's got to be like an accidental job. Like somebody was looking on Craigslist and saw a used ice cream truck. Yeah. It was like, I, I could do that. You know what? Light bulb. Yeah, Boom, totally. Let's go. It's so got to be I, something all the time. So like I said, I barely got through high school and decided to hold off on college right after high school. And uh, 
through another family friend was offered a job at a Wendy's. Um, oh. And I made it 45 minutes. <laughs> So I didn't even make it through the whole training video. Was it like I, a PTSD? Or did a guy hand you like a broom and the little thing? And you're like, no, <laughs> don't swear at people. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're not the boss of me. <laughs> so I literally am. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so uh, no. So the lady, the I, I get there. It's my first day, and I get there, and she hands me a uniform shirt and a hat that are clearly used. <laughs> I was at 18. I was six, four and maybe 150 pounds. Like okay. stick bug. And she hands me a double XL shirt with grease stains on it. Oh, good. And, uh, says, sits down and says, uh, you know, watch this training video. And I'm sitting here watching a training video about, you know, how to make the square burger square. I don't remember. And all I could hear was her <laughs> screaming at someone in the kitchen. I could literally hear her walk out from talking to me and then walk out there and start screaming at somebody. And I just went, yeah, nah, <laughs> walked out. And uh, <laughs> the um, square burger thing. I never understood that. Yeah, It's almost burger. like it's trying to, it's almost like the heavy metal of cheeseburgers. Like I've got to do something different. I've oh, got to yeah. get out there. I've got to, yeah, I can't be around like the other cheeseburgers. Yeah. In a saturated market. How do we set ourselves apart? I know it. We'll wear I masks know. and the singer will dress like a priest. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so, you, exactly. So, so you didn't uh, make it. Yeah. So that was 45 minutes left. And then it was about a week later. Uh, my parents next door neighbor said to me. Uh, so my friend, my friend, Paul's dad owns a locksmith shop and they're looking for a front counter guy. And I was like, cool. Like that sounds interesting. Sounds better than fucking flipping burgers and greasy t-shirts. Yeah. And, uh, met with them immediately got along and, uh, started. I want to say it was, that was like a Friday that I met them. And I think I started that Monday and it was just man in the counter and cutting keys and answering the phones. And, um, and immediately enjoyed it. There was something about it was ultra chaotic because the day that I started was for whatever reason, one of it was just one of those days for the shop. They were slammed busy million people coming in and out of the shop. And then at the end of the day, they get a phone call from the manager of the Rockford Speedway, the local racetrack that someone had. And I'm sure you've seen the Rockford Speedway online. If you've ever seen, uh, videos of school bus figure eight races. Yeah, baby. You have seen the Rockford Speedway. That's kind of yeah. where that was born. Yeah. Um, I'm sure someone from North Carolina is in the comments mad about that statement, but fight me. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so uh, they, uh, someone from the Rockford Speedway had called and said, Hey, someone just ran off with one of our master keys. And we went over there and had to rekey, change the locks on the entire facility. We were there till like 11 o'clock at night. It was my very first day. So it You're was like only eight... supposed to give the key to a key holder that you trust. How is this yeah, possible? Exactly. So it was like eight in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. And in my head, I thought every day was going to be like that. And I went, <laughs> Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> when am I going to play PlayStation and hang out with my cat? Like I've totally screwed up. And, uh, right. Luckily it calmed down after that. And then, yeah, I kept cruising, cutting keys, answering phones. Um, eventually started going out on calls with the owner. Um, just driving out on calls with him and he started teaching me stuff in the field. AC solution offers complete plug and play air conditioning conversion kits for your classic BMW, such as the E30, E28 and E24 and soon to be Porsche featuring OEM quality components with period correct finishes and materials. Their products are designed as a drop in upgrade to your old factory system, but with the performance of modern technology. Their products stem from hands-on design and development with a deep knowledge and passion for these vehicles. They're designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts and come complete with a full warranty and quality instructions mirroring those of a factory manual. Check out all their offerings at acsolutions.co, acsolutions.co. Petrol Box is a monthly service made specifically for the automotive enthusiasts. Each month, they carefully select items including tools, detailing supplies, apparel, garage gear, stickers, and publications to be sent right to your doorstep. It's a curated selection of the latest and greatest gear in the industry. There are actually two different levels of subscription to choose from. The Petrobox Classic costs less than $20 a month, while the Petrobox Premium 
gets you more gear for $39.95 a month. Check them out at mypetrolbox.com and be sure to use the code OVERCREST at checkout to get $6 off your first month. Um, I was there maybe three months. and uh... Why did he decide to take you out? Did he did he like you or what was the reason that he took you off the front desk? Because he had to have I... been... If he does that, he's got to replace you at the front desk. Yeah. You know? So he had some family. So it, it was a, a family owned shop and I was the only one that worked there that wasn't related. And that was as awesome as it sounds. Um, so, <laughs> uh, um, I, I don't know if it was necessity or he saw something going on there. I really can't answer that question. Um, sure. but what, why I brought up the family thing was he had his wife worked there he had his kids that would help out there. So there's always kind of somebody around to help out at the counter. Sure. Um, so he really started training me how to unlock cars. That was kind of the first thing I learned how to do in the field was open cars. So and I, do you, you never use the terminology of break into, even though that's exactly what you're oh, doing. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. It's, right. It's, you're, it's you're, you're breaking, you're opening or access. unlocking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> gain access. Well, you're absolutely. You ever be, you ever walk down the street and see a car and just go, yeah, I could, I could, I could gain access to that, to that so, vehicle right there. <laughs> so I used to <laughs> practice on my friends' cars. So I, like, I had a uh, some of me and my friends were really into S tens around that time. Okay, and this is a few years later after I'd really kind of cut my teeth on stuff, and uh, I'd walk, to, I'd be say at Target and see one of my friends' trucks. And all I would do is start it and then turn it around backwards in the spot and yeah. then leave while they were in the store. Even then, start it. You even could start the truck. Yeah. Yeah. I can, wow. pick it. I, can I, I don't know if I still could because I haven't really regularly touched automotive in shoot since 2013, basically. How long does um, it take you to, to do this? Pro- Walk me through this process of what it is to get into a truck and pick the ignition. Okay. What, what do you need? How hard is it? And just, just walk me through it a little bit. So um, it depends on, let me think. The way we would usually enter vehicles is with what are called air wedges. Um, yep. You've probably seen them at Home Depot and stuff. They market them to level doors and stuff while you're hanging them. If you put those <laughs> in the door frame of a vehicle and pump them up a little bit, you can actually separate the door frame. Just yeah, a little bit like this. I've seen that in action when I've locked myself out of the car. So, you know, yeah. And then you use, yeah. uh, it was called a steck tool, which is basically just a glorified stiff coat hanger. Um, and that's, it's just a long coat hanger with a little finger on it that sticks down like this. And from there you can hit power locks. You can hit manual locks. I could usually roll down with the crank. I could roll down the window if I had to like Ford products, um, have like a safety egress feature where if the door is locked, you can still pop it open from the inside. You know, you can pull the handle and it will open. Yep. Yeah. That um, one's easy. Yep. So the, those are, pull- you want to get those calls, man. Yeah. yeah. I've got a, I've got a Mercury grand marquee. I locked my, I'm on my way. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. 10 seconds of work and 90 bucks. So yep. <laughs> I used to yep. tell everybody, you didn't pay me to open it. You paid me to drive over here and open it. <laughs> so, uh, so then uh, once you're in, uh, I had a set of specialized picks for different types of automotive ignitions. So let's say um, after, um, when was it? 1994 was when S10s went to the second generation and they switched to 10 cut keys where it was a double-sided key. Um, those have a sidebar where inside the lock are 10 little wafers that ride on the key. On mm-hmm. the side of the wafers is a little groove. And what you're trying to do is line that groove up all the way across and that allows the sidebar somewhere to drop in which allows it to turn. Sure. Um, you know, the sidebar is literally just a little bar that pokes out of the core that blocks it from turning. So I had a special tool that would sneak around the plastic trim of the ignition in between the core and the housing. And I could put pressure on that sidebar. And then I had a key that was cut like a wave. It was literally cut like this. Yep. And I would just take that. I would put sidebar pressure on it, and I would take that key, and I would just run it in and out until the ignition turned. You're just raking it back and forth, raking exactly. It, I think. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I could. Uh, so when I had a, I had a 2002 Sonoma. I used to practice on just for fun, and I could be locked doors to sitting in it and running in about 90 seconds. So. So was there? What is the difference between? So I've 
I've tried to get, I've broken into a few cars. So I actually bought one of those hand pump things. Mm -hmm. So I bought a car that had no key once mm -hmm. recently. It was an old, uh, it was like a 76 Mercedes. I've seen and it. one on your Instagram with the, that's uh, the one that thing yeah, that's the one rules, by the way, man, it was, it was, it was, it was dope. It's long gone, but it was dope at the time. But I ended up using that little thing, boop, 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 to push the door open. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up unlocking the car, you know, very easily once I had mm -hmm. pried the door open a little bit. Yeah. But actually getting that ignition to turn, at least on those, on a Mercedes, is a whole nother story. I don't mm -hmm. think it's, it's not as easy as an S10, right? There are different variations of like ignition cylinders that mm -hmm. are much harder to, yeah. to deal with. So some of those you can use what's called a leashy tool, which will actually pick it and read it at the same time. So it goes pin by pin or wafer by wafer and actually will give you the cuts as you're picking it. So once you pick it, you can actually take that information and generate a key. It's called a <laughs> leashy pick. Um, <laughs> they make them specifically for different vehicles. Like uh, the, uh, I worked for a locksmith shop locally very briefly and uh, they had a whole set of them. So you'd roll out and it would be like a, you know, a Toyota double sided from the 2000s and you'd have the specific tool for that ignition. It was super so fun. Basically, what you're saying is if someone wants your car, they're going to get your car. To a point, yeah. yeah I mean, I, yeah. I can't speak to a lot of the newer stuff because I'm so far removed. Yeah, we don't it. even talk about that yeah. stuff here. Yeah. That stuff doesn't Fair even enough. like – that stuff is like we're, – we're stuck in like 1998 oh, rules. And, and, and older. Yeah. I'm literally <laughs> sitting next to two giant tube amps, I understand. So Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so my, uh, my only experience with really picking a lock, I was with a buddy who shall remain nameless – he will know who he is when I tell this story. But I was in California and him and I were out driving around and he had an old vehicle. I don't, he, he's very concerned because he's kind of known in his community. Um, he had an old vehicle that I, I enjoy a lot. I may or may not own a variation of this vehicle that Fair has enough. a rear, that engine is in the rear. And it may <laughs> have been orange with a roof rack and rack. And he may surf occasionally and he's quite <laughs> funny. So if anybody's listening, they can figure it out. Vague. Anyway, so we're driving around. <laughs> And we, we're trying to find a way to access these gravel roads that are on these, uh, on these um, back in the hills above his house. Anyway, I'll, I'll go get right to it. We, we get to a gate, and there's a lock on the gate. I actually have – oh, please tell me I have the lock. I do. I have the lock right now. Oh, here. my God. That rules. It is – it is one of these locks like this right here. Oh yeah. Yeah. So this is a, <laughs> this is a master lock with the rotating, um, uh -huh. whatever it's, whatever it's called right here. Uh -huh. And, and we're like, and he's, he's all defeated. He's like, we can't go any farther. And I go, yes, we can bet. And, and, and I bet. So I take this thing and I, and I start just doing this and I start just walking my fingers over the mm -hmm. thing. Looking and for the flat spots, looking for the flat spots. You can feel it. And sure enough, all the guy had done is move one number because people are lazy, dude. Uh -huh. <laughs> that guy has to go in and out of that gate however many times, and he doesn't want to do the whole thing where he yeah, dude. just scrapes the whole lock and rakes it with his fingers to where he has to go back. When he goes through again, got to go through the number. And it's the same thing with people's PIN numbers. Yep. There's been Airbnbs where um, they didn't give me the code, and mm -hmm. the code is like 1230. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time or mm -hmm. one, two, three, nine or something mm -hmm. like that. People are lazy. So sure enough, boom, yep. boom, boom. There it is. I look like a hero. I was like, tch, tch, open the lock, swung the gate open. And he's like, what? <laughs> so that is, that is, that is my, my there only. There is a, there is an electronic push button lock. That's uh, that. This is actually sensitive information. So I don't want to get too specific, but there is a push button lock. That's very common in the field that has an, a factory programmed management code. So you can punch in a user code, but there's also a management code that you use to enter like programming mode. Yeah. And when I see those in the wild, I like to walk up and start poking at them just to see what happens. And 99 times out of a hundred, the management code is still the factory. The same. Yeah. People are lazy, man. Yeah. So I, it, I, like it's... I, I've gotten into, many bathrooms in many office buildings by doing that and uh, there's been ones where <laughs> i've walked up and set my own user code to the lock and just been you know oh cool now i have my own personal code to this bathroom in this starbucks that's awesome so <laughs> <laughs> so you even end up being a locksmith and kind of a you're talking about rockford and that it was mm -hmm. kind of sketchy where you were hanging out and playing guitar and living and stuff like that 
that's where you were a locksmith as well, right? Yeah, for 11 years, from uh, 2002 okay. to 2013, yeah. Have you have you ever been called to the scene of a crime to like have the the police like, hey, we need to get in here? Yes. Or have you ever yeah. been like anything like that? Or uh, welfare checks. We've had welfare a, checks. Several welf- welfare checks. Um, yeah, uh, out there with a couple of sheriffs, deputies, and owners of said building who didn't have keys for whatever reason, say they were changed unbeknownst to them, or um, they were just poorly organized and didn't have keys. Um, seen a couple of suicides firsthand a um, couple of elderly people that were passed away. Um, there was one where a guy had his uh, lazy boy right four feet from the front door of the house and swung the front door of the house open. And he had let's just uh, unalived himself with a shotgun in the chair. Weeks dude, that dude prior. wanted to put himself on display, man. Yeah. Weeks prior. It was right there. Ugh. And, uh, and uh, yeah, that's, I will never, ever in a million years forget that. Um, that was that was a tough one um a lot of order of protections we would help out with uh say domestic dispute somebody gets an order of protection needs their locks changed you know they need to have a significant other they need locked out of their house or apartment or whatever and uh you know i'm in the middle of working on this stuff and the guy or you know gal shows up while i'm there working screaming and yelling and threatening me and um it's almost like being a repo man uh-huh. I guess in Done some ways, too. right? Yeah. Yeah. We used to do a lot of replevins, which is uh, for like Aaron's rental or like rent a center. One of those kind of places. So you stop paying on your washer and dryer and uh, they get a search warrant, uh, search and seizure. Is that warrant how that works? Come back. Yeah. So you have the flat screen TV from rent a center that you're mm-hmm. paying more than it would be to just have it on a credit card. Mm-hmm. And they call up Dan. Mm-hmm. to go get their TV. Are you by yourself or do you have a I, repo guy with? So I rock up to the house. It's usually us and a sheriff's deputy that's there to serve the papers because it is legal warrant papers. And then a few guys from whatever rental agency that are there. And we rock up to your house. And if you don't answer the door, I open it and they go in and get whatever. Um, Good grief, man. Yeah, man. And uh, you ever I mean, feel any pressure them... on that? Is it, is it, oh, tenu- yeah. these got to be some pretty tenuous situations. Any of those yeah. ever go wrong? So uh, we had one one time where uh, as I'm picking it, they're the Aaron's guys are telling the sheriff's deputies how this guy's threatened them a bunch of times. And, uh, I noticed that both the sheriff's deputies have vests on and I don't have a vest (laughs) and I'm on one knee in front of the door working on this knob or whatever it was. And, uh, just thinking, you know, I was like 22 years old making like 10 bucks an hour. Like, yeah, this is, this is totally worth it. You know, (laughs) (laughs) this is great. Um, Yeah. Uh, had a guy swing the door open one time and full blown like football punt me in the rib cage. Uh, had a lady throw a frying pan at me one time, opened her door and threw a frying pan at me. Um, immediately. Man, you really got to love that sofa, man. The yeah. sofa from Rena center. You got to really love that sofa yeah. to be throwing <laughs> frying pans at the locksmith when he comes to get it. So my, my favorite was when they had moved and then through whatever uh, means, I still don't really know how they did it. But through whatever means, the Aaron's guys track them down to their next spot. So they they think they got away with it. Then we show up and just walk in their house and take their stuff. Um, but, Everybody needs, uh, everybody's got a water bill, man. Can't be that yeah. hard to look up, right? Yeah, exact. That's yeah. So I mean, what we've they should have done, done is they should have taken the sofa to the uh, Victorian house <laughs> with no water. It would have been fine. You could have had. You could have been jamming on the couch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's never would have found a place you. To, place to pass out. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, so, how did you get scabies? Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, we've done them where you open the door and they're they've got an order to grab the TV, and the guy's sitting there watching the TV. They walk in and unplug it and just walk out with it, and the guy doesn't say a thing. We've had those. Um, one of my favorites was uh, trying to pick the pick the knob and I pick it. And as I'm packing my picks up, I see the core, the cylinder go and turn back on its own. And I went, Oh, somebody on the other side, just relocked the door. Yep. So I picked it. I picked it again real quick. I picked it again real quick, stuck a flathead screwdriver in it, just held it there. And I could feel them trying to turn the little thumb turn on the inside. And I just told the cops like, this is unlocked right now, but they're trying to relock it on the inside. So they counted to three and threw their shoulders into it. And I like tucked and rolled out of the way. Man. I was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> um, we had one where the lady kept relocking the deadbolt on me. 
And I told one of the errands guys, uh, go around to the back of the house and just start banging on the back door and jiggling the back door around. So I waited a minute and I heard, doo, 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 doo. I heard footsteps at the back of the house and I quick picked it real fast and I opened the door open and I just hear this like, you motherfucker from inside the house. Jeez, um, man. You ever feel I, like, like you're in danger? Like there was other, you know, obviously the vest one, sure. But did you ever get yeah. into a situation where you really needed to extricate yourself from something carefully? So on a replevin one time, it was in, uh, it was in kind of that same Avon neighborhood I was talking about. We had a, a replevin to do. And for whatever reason, I could not pick this front door. It would not pick. And I can't drill it to get in. You know, I can't damage anything because we have to leave it in the same state that we found it. Yep. And uh, so there's a pit bull in the backyard. So I was like, I ain't going in that backyard. There's no way. Um, so I'm looking at the front of the house and realize that there's a window air conditioning unit in the <laughs> And looked at it and just thought, I get that air conditioning unit out. <laughs> so Easiest lockpick ever. Yeah, I get a little uh, little step ladder and I go and I pull the air conditioning unit out. And then I turn and realize that I'm the only person that can fit through the window of that group of people. <laughs> and went, I think I was 20 at the time. And I was like, cool, got it. Don't worry about it. And just crawled in the window. And the second my feet touched the ground, I went, this is the dumbest fucking thing I've ever done in my life. Seriously. And uh, Yeah. And then beeline to the front door just as fast as I could came flying out the front door, just adrenaline pumping. Like I put myself in that situation and I hear somebody farting around my front door. Suddenly the window air conditioner unit pops out and some guy crawls in through my window. And I, you know, Dude, just like that's now, a good I'm, way to get shot. A thousand percent, man. That was so luckily no one was home, but that could have gone sideways real fast. As soon as that you was, went in there, the cop and the other guy probably looked at each other and went, what the fuck is that guy? Ten doing? bucks an hour. And, uh, so, <laughs> uh, that one, um, few uh, domestic disputes got in the middle of those. Um, there was, uh, uh, I wouldn't really call it danger. Um, let me think. Um, there was a, uh, a rekey that I did one time. I was there changing the locks on a house and, uh, there was, it was a lady that had called us out to the house and she said that it was for her boyfriend. Yeah. It's my boyfriend's house. You know, I'm just, you know, and, and our kind of policy, I mean, that's already was, gotta be like, all right, red flag. Yeah. Girlfriend's calling for the, the boyfriend's key. Yeah. He locked me out. I don't know what happened. A hundred percent. So come on. Our kind of policy was if you have a key to it, that's kind of all we needed. You know, if you but have, then what do they need you for dude? It. Well, Oh, you're so talking about for a rekey. A rekey. A rekey. Yeah. Okay. A re -key. Okay. So I yeah. find out that, um, and this is in a very nice neighborhood. So, uh, so we didn't think that much. Hey, of rich it. people are assholes too, man. Oh man, I'm Montecito <laughs> adjacent. You want to tell me about it? <laughs> so, but so, Ellen's practically my neighbor. I'll tell you all about it. So, <laughs> but uh, so uh, she's got a key. You know, she has access to it. That's fine. So I go over there and I'm, I'm rekeying it and kind of through overhearing her on the phone as I'm doing this work, I find out that she's the neighbor and she's having an affair with the guy that lives there and they're locking the wife out. Oh shit. Yeah. So what do you do? <laughs> I mean, so, you're not the moral was, police though, right? That so, like, was kind of it. I mean, I'm like, what can I do? I'm just, you know, that sucks. I can sit here and mentally talk shit all I want, but it's not really my place to get in here and be like, you know, you're being a real word you told me not to say on the podcast. Yeah, you can't um, offer the key to anybody's heart, right? That's not your job. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> oh, believe me, I've tried. So, <laughs> so, uh, um, so I go about my job. You know, I, I do what I need to do. I, I, I rekey all the locks and uh do the paperwork collects and then uh she leaves i'm sitting in the van sitting in my van parked on the street getting ready to go to my next job and a car pulls up in the driveway and a lady gets out with two kids oh no <laughs> and uh she immediately catches what's going on she walks over to my van and says uh you changed the locks didn't you i said yep and she goes, uh, 
well, now I'm locked out of my house and all my stuff's in there. And, you know, my, me and my kids live here and whatever. And I just said, uh, do you have an ID on you? She goes, yeah. So I, I look at her ID and it has the address for that house on it. Yep. And I said, uh, has there been an order of protection or anything filed against you? And she goes, no, because they have to be notified when that happens. Right. She goes, no. And I was like, legally, that's all I'm required to hear is no. So I was like, cool, I got you. And uh, I still had the cuts written down from the key from when I uh, rekeyed it. So I just made another one, <laughs> opened it back up, and then changed it back. <laughs> <laughs> or change it to a different key, I should say. And uh, immediately changed it back. And uh, she paid me again. And, uh, Dang, pretty good deal. Yeah. So it's one of those, I wouldn't call it danger, but it was just one of those situations of. That's some serious discomfort, though, man. I mean, I you're right in the yeah. middle of a domestic issue. Yeah. That's... That was, I always tried to remain impartial, which is hard, you know. Um, you have to. You have to let people live their life. You're yeah. You're not the the arbiter, right? Yeah. I'm not there to be Dr. Phil, you know, that's a, and, and it's not up to me, you know, as long as people fulfill their legal obligations for the work I'm doing, that's really all I can ask people for. Um, you know, I've had a gazillion people call me on lockouts. And as soon as I start asking for IDs or any kind of information, they get squirrely about it. And I, I'm like, cool, I'm not doing it then, you know? Right. So, you know, in, in this industry, your reputation is everything. If you blow your reputation, then it's like, you might as well go do something else. Right. Yeah, Absolutely. So that was a close call, but has anyone ever, do you have a, a very memorable time someone asked you to unlock something that wasn't theirs? We had, um, I used to do a lot of safe work. Um, and we would have guys like, regular... like the, like the, tur like listening to the tumblers, no, you turn it no, and go back I and never... forth, like the movies. That's a little, that is possible, but that can take days to do. Not with our hearing either. <laughs> There's that, you know, my, my tinnitus <laughs> overrides everything. Um, <laughs> Like uh, watching the Italian job, the remake, and the guy's doing it underwater in about 45 seconds. Yeah. Well, water does transfer sound really well. Oh, well, there's that. It, but, I mean, um, we, could, we could go with that. So, uh, yeah, we'd, we'd have people bring in the little sentry lockboxes regularly and say, oh, yeah, this is my uncle's. I need this. Oh, he passed away. I need this opened. And as soon as we'd start asking for IDs or anything, they'd get real weird. And uh, we'd just be like, cool, just come back when you got paperwork, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, We've had cars, you know, oh, yeah, I need to get my, get into my car. Um, you kind of get to see people at their lowest, man. In, in many cases, this, these yeah. people are really low. That was, I don't miss that aspect of it at all. Because, uh, excuse me, I don't work private anymore. And uh, I do not miss that. We used to do a lot of evictions and a lot of stuff. And uh, that's definitely one aspect I don't miss. I mean, nobody calls us because they want us to be there. Um a lot of times you get called on lockouts and stuff and they're mad or embarrassed that they lock themselves out of their house or car. And I'm the guy that happens to be standing in front of them that they can take it out on. And so. they can look at you and go, it, it can be expensive. If you don't have yeah. AAA and you have to call a locksmith, especially if it's late, yeah. it ain't cheap. Yeah. But you're also yeah. getting Dan out of bed. He's got to get his pants on and like wake <laughs> you're up. Lucky. Shake the <laughs> shake the cow. I just imagine the pantsless locksmith service. Donald the, Duck's the... locksmith service. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, imagine what the what this, the delivery on the side of the truck could look like. It could just be like from the waist up a picture of a really happy locksmith Good on the gravy. side of their pants. Daniel's packing heat. <laughs> oh man, or Donald. I, mean, I meant to say Donald. Freudian sleep. Slip. <laughs> Depending on the neighborhood, this could be a this could be a great. Uh, I used to do a lot of work in the Castro in San Francisco. So yeah, pantsless. <laughs> lock service <laughs> <laughs> it would definitely fly there for sure man <laughs> yeah yeah we'll, we'll we'll open up everything for you um, and, and we we won't even bend you over to do it <laughs> specialize in back doors dude <laughs> <laughs> all right we got we, we, we got so have you ever opened any like i love i love old locks uh-huh anytime i go to like uh when i'm out you know scouting for the rallies if you go to these little places like i was in arkansas and they had all these general stores and a lot of these general stores were real general stores you go in there they have everything yeah and some of them have lots of old shit that's just uh -huh. been there that never sold but then they yeah, still man. have it and a lot of times there's just like these old locks that sometimes they don't even have a key they're just there mm -hmm. have you ever gone and opened like someone's like hey i need to open this and the lock yeah. is i've never seen one of these before what's the oldest lock you've ever unlocked um probably some old bit locks bit meaning like skeleton key um Rockford being what it was, I mean, some of those houses date back to the 1800s and still have original hardware on them. 
So you'd have old Russwin and Sargent hardware, Yale, old Yale hardware on those. Um, those were usually pretty easy, um, depending on the lock. Um, so What's we would point? have like back in the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much of a deterrent would that have been? Cause you can just get us, you can just hook them open. Right. Depends on the lock. Um, some of them have again, like little wafers that have to move up and down. Like you'll see the key will look like a little city skyline, like, you know, varying heights, but they're yep. like evenly, evenly spaced out. There's little wafers that are all packed together that have to ride against those and line up in such a fashion as to allow a part to move through them. So you can't just um, put pressure on it mm -mm. and then go through and like tick each one, like nope. walk a pick back and then it'll nope. just turn. So usually what I would do in those situations is not, I wouldn't attack the lock itself. I would usually look for like a, a alternate means of entry. Usually those you can credit card real easy. Mm -hmm. um, or I'd look for a window or something else. I mean, if I did have to make a key for those, there's a, a trick called impressioning with those where you can burn. So I get a blank skeleton key that is roughly the size that I think it's going to be. Cause sometimes you don't always know on some of that older stuff. And I will actually burn it with a wood match to get soot on it. And then watch where, when I try to turn it inside the lock, I look for where that's marking on the key and that's where I touch it with a file. And that mm. requires patience. Some of those can take several hours to do. Is that just basically you don't want to destroy the lock? Turns over on you, and you're good to go. Um, but you basically, are you doing that because you don't want to destroy the lock, or what's the reason? Because a lot of this stuff, you could just cut the lock, right? But you don't want to destroy the lock. Did I lose you, oh, motherfucker? I lost you, buddy. Oh, I'm back. I got you. You back? All right. Yeah, motherfucker. Let's, let's, that's all right. It's no big deal. I'll edit it. No one will ever know. It'll be our secret Sweet. or I'll leave okay. it in and fuck it. Who gives a shit? <laughs> so are you basically doing this? So you don't have to destroy the lock. Yeah. Is that kind of because is that a point of pride or to is a it point. something I mean, that... that's why you're calling me? I mean, anybody can drill a lockout. I mean, not necessarily, but I mean, any dipshit with a DeWalt can get into most things. Right. So, um, you know, that's why you're calling me out and paying me is because I have the knowledge and experience to like breeze through things without having to trash them. I mean, what's, sometimes you do. That's just the nature of the business. Um, what's the coolest thing you've ever found behind a lock that the person, maybe the person didn't know what was there. Dildo. You know, like, hey, really? Someone had yeah. called you out to find a cock. That's what they somebody, found. Somebody brought a, uh, one of those century lock boxes in. Had a big, and it was uh, his aunt's. It was his aunt's lockbox. Oh no! Yeah. No, Aunt <laughs> Betty, what have you done? <laughs> that was, that was pretty funny. Uh, that was a whole event. Um, uh, one time it was, uh, in a safe, it was $17,825. I always remember that number. Damn. Um, and, uh, they had said, oh yeah, you can have this old safe. If, uh, you guys come and pull it out, it was in there. Uh, so in, in, in Illinois, there's basements. Uh, I say that only cause I live in California now and there's not basements. Yeah. Um, but this house specifically had a crawl space because it was right up against the rock river. And they had this uh, antique safe in their crawl space and said, look, just get it out of here and you guys can have it. So me and one of the well, guys. Well, it's no up, easy feat to get these safes out. That. Like if you look on Facebook Marketplace, mm -hmm. you can see, dude, you should just start getting all the free safes on Facebook Marketplace. The it's almost like those, storage wars, but. Yeah, they're full of asbestos and stuff. It's a whole thing. So. Oh, no good. Not good. Because yeah, they're have... free. You pick yeah. this up, you can have this 450 pound, three foot by four foot safe. Yeah. Some of those antique ones have tear gas in them too. No joke. What? Yeah, dude. That's a deterrent. Some of those old ones have tear gas on spring loaded pistons that will actually shatter the vial. And uh, we've run across those more than once. That is a bummer that'll fuck your whole day up jesus christ so, but what was yeah. in there was it worth it so well the one that we ran across was in a lumber supply yard and it was an old train building that they turned into this like lumber supply house and this was dated back to like turn of the century and they had this old antique vault door in there and they had they lost a combo or it had failed i don't remember and me and one of the other guys went out there to open it and uh, those are easy. I mean, you can, there's a trick you can do. You can drill one hole and then look in there with a scope and manipulate them to open them. That's usually, oh, I've seen that on TV. Yeah. 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 So I've, um, I've, I've seen that in the movies. That's some yep. James Bond shit right there. Yep. So we're drilling along, we're doing our thing. And all of a sudden it's like, your throat burning. My eyes are kind of itchy. We just kind of looked at each other like, motherfucker. <laughs> like, and uh, it was like, everybody out of the office, we got to go. 
So fire department had to come down and evacuate the air out of the building. Um, Jesus. So do you just wait thing, yeah. and just yeah, wait and wait until. Do. Yeah, that's all you can do. Um, it's amazing that that stuff still works after like a century. Yeah, There's I mean, it's, still va- some it's vacuum sealed in a gas. glass, vacuum sealed in a glass cylinder. There's nothing really to go bad there. So, right. Um, some of them are real devious. They've got layers of ball bearings literally there to snap your drill bits. You hit the ball bearings and it just snaps your drill bit off. Um, they get they get devious with some of the deterrents they've got built into them. But uh, yeah, the uh, the cash one was the safe in a crawl space. And they said, if you come and get it, you can have it. We used to do that regularly. We'd go grab something and then pull it out and restore it or whatever it needed, service it, and we'd just sell it as used. We used to do that on a regular basis. And uh, you know, we we had a full paint shop at the shop, which was kind of cool. So we'd you know sand them down and paint them if they needed it. And um, so we go grab this thing, and me and the other guy are sitting in our shop drilling on it. And we finally get it open, and there's nothing in there, but it's got the built-in wood. Some of them had kind of like wood cabinets built into them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And down the side of it, there's three little wood drawers that pull out. And he opens my one coworker, he opens one of the drawers and it's just stacked with bills. And we both went, didn't touch it. Not me. Like, but we both just backed away. Like, I didn't touch it. Did you touch it? I didn't touch it. So why? we ended up, we ended up, he, the all, dude said you could have it. So why are you backing away all nervous? Just because that's, like I said, reputation is everything. Oh. That's, you know, that's, that's, you know, if you, if you do anything even remotely dishonest, you might as well do something else. So, yep. um, you know, in a business where you're paid to break into stuff, that's a, that's really important. So we end up, it was me and him. And then our, the owner of the business, my boss, uh, we independently counted the cash of each other, made sure we all came up with the same number. He took it, stuck it in an envelope, put it in the safe in the shop. And we just called the guy and said, yo, we found almost 18 grand in this thing. And he was like we were thinking he was going to freak out and it was it was a very wealthy family that we were working for yeah we thought he was going to just like think about you or i somebody says hey i found 18 grand that's yours that you didn't know existed i'm losing my mind i'm thinking yeah, dude. camshafts i'm thinking rear differential for the car mm-hmm. i'm all set man yeah man i'm thinking finally project car anyway um <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh and he was like a oh. finder's fee nothing he goes <laughs> He goes, cool. I'll be down there in the next couple of days to get it. Dude, I'm down there like, in 20 minutes, man. Ye- I'm not even wearing a seat belt on the way there. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm rolling those dice and then I'm going to roll the dice. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, that was honestly probably one of the cooler things we ever found was that uh, we used to do a lot of work for the ATF where they would call us out and say, hey, we got this safe on a property, you know, come and you know, pop it open. Well, they would usually pull them on a warrant and then bring them back to their facility. And we'd go over and open them over at their facility. You're talking like the giant Liberty safes, just the big, the big guys that are full of guns mm-hmm. and gold bars and silver and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and Bibles. Yeah. We've had several. Yeah. <laughs> we've had, uh, the, uh, was it the Remington 223 freedom bucket? I don't know. I just made me think of that. <laughs> that, well, that was uh, the name of the safe. No, 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 no. There's a, a, you can buy bulk Remington ammunition literally in a bucket. And it's called the freedom bucket. And it's the funniest fucking thing I've ever seen. I see. Um, (laughs) So, uh, um, so, I mean, we've had several firearm hoarder situations in those. Um, And my favorite part of those was watching the ATF agents look at it and just realize all the paperwork they now have to do. Oh, because there's (laughs) 17 guns in there. Yeah. More than sometimes. Yeah. And they're like, great. Now we have to log all this shit. You ever Um, find any drugs or anything? uh, No, I never really did. So I'm sure okay. there was something, but nothing that I've really came across. So most of those were in my house anyway. So, so what's in your yeah. toolbox? What's in a locksmith's arsenal? General Typically, stuff. Like, what do you, like, if you, let's say, oh, let me rephrase this. Cause obviously you need a, a freaking truck for everything that you need, mm-hmm. but let's say you have to fit everything in a, in a little toolbox, like a little craftsman metal box. What are you bringing mm-hmm. with you? Someone's asking you to get into somewhere. What are you bringing with you in that little toolbox? It depends on the somewhere. Um, or the something, mm. um, I mean, really it's general tools. I mean, 99, I mean, it's, there's all this cool stuff that happened, but 99% of the time we're just doing general repairs and hardware swaps and you know, that's screwdrivers. Um, yeah. but as far as specialized tools, I mean, we've got, um, you know, picks obviously, and everybody uses different picks. That's the thing. Picking is like fingerprints. Everybody's kind of got their own touch to it. So I um, feel like I've, I've picked a few locks. I bought like this. I, I was on what is it uh locks 
lock picking lawyer or whatever. Oh, dude, dude, I went in, I went in deep on that guy's YouTube the channel. Michael that Jordan is, of lock picking. So is he really is he good that good? Like what 100%. makes this dude good? Hundred like, percent. Some people just have it. You know, so you know why is Michael Jordan good at basketball? He just is. He's the Michael Hard Jordan of, of lock picking. That's that's yeah. that's amazing. I, I mean, mean I was really like is. having some sex success with a master lock. I can pick a master lock now, like a standard padlock. Feels good, man. It. It's the most yeah, satisfying like, thing in the world. But I'm watching him pick Medico high security stuff, where not only do you have the up and down of the pin, you also have to have the right rotational angle of the pin. And watching him pick those, just I can't get my brain around that. I mean, he's. He's put the work in. I'll give credit where credit's due. Like him and uh, Bosnian Bills, another big guy that does a lot of it. He does a lot of like, yeah. puzzle locks and stuff. Bosnian Bills cool because he makes a lot of his own parts. Like he makes his own pins and stuff, and literally tries to make them tricky. Um, so what's like I, when you think of a high? You say high security lock. I'm thinking mm-hmm. of what's on my house and what's at Home Depot. Like what are what are the brands like? Sta- like uh, Schlag, Quick Schlag, Schlag, right? I, yeah. I see that's yeah. I see that all over the place. Mm-hmm. why should I, is there any point in me going online and buying something better than that? You know, better um, than what I can get at home Depot. What makes a lock high security? I feel like dude, every lock should be high security. It's yeah. a lock. I mean, theoretically you know, like, they all are. Yeah. But I used to tell people this is if somebody's going to break into your house, they're going to a con their way in or B mm-hmm. throw a rock through your window. That's right. 99% of it. So, you know, I've, in my entire career over two decades now, I've heard of one person picking a lock for theft purposes. So it's just, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. I mean, locks are really there to keep honest people out and it really, it's not even necessarily a high security issue. It's a proper installation issue. So if you don't have a deadbolt on your door, you have a little spring loaded latch that makes a half inch engagement at best. If it's installed properly. Um, and usually it's a tiny brass plate with two half inch screws that hold it into the trim of your door frame, not even yep. your door frame, the trim of your door frame. If you have a deadbolt on there, you know, you've got full one inch extension of a bolt that locks in place. If it's properly installed, you've got two inch wood screws that are dropping all the way back into the stud works of your frame. That's where all your strength's going to come from. Right. So I, 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 can't and all that is defeated that by a credit card, dude, because the door closes from the inside. And it has to be able to, I don't know what the part's called, but the latch has to be able to shut so it's spring-loaded. Right. I used to be able to just walk into my parents' house. I wouldn't even go get the key that they kept under the awning by the garage. Mm-hmm. I would just take my credit card out and just go like this and just go, wunk, and just yep. walk so, my credit key into the... I've done that on friends' houses, multiple places. Can't do it on my house. I made sure of that. Yeah, the only reason definitely... that works is improper installation. Okay. Um, so if you look at a dead latch, a standard dead latch on a home... There's two parts to it. And I'm talking the little wedge shaped bit that sticks out of the door. So you yep. have the little wedge shaped guy that comes out of the door. And then there's a little pin that's like this, that that's next, that rides next to it. Yes. If you push that pin in, you can't push the latch back. So what needs to happen is when it drops into the hole. So you close the door, it lines up with the strike plate that the latch drops in. The pin does not. Yeah. So that prevents you from being able to credit card the latch backwards. I got to look and make sure that my lot, my doors have that because mm-hmm. grandma, grandpa's door didn't have that pin, man. <laughs> I got you. So it, but like I said, a, a deadbolt is 99% of it. So right. um, if you don't have a deadbolt on there, you know, that's, that's the move. I tell everyone and their mom that, you know, um, and they're not terribly hard to install. If you can use a tape measure and a drill, they're not the worst. So, you know, I used to use a, a whole clamp on jig to do them. And anymore, I just use a ruler and a pencil. So, right. Um, you know, two and an eighth inch hole on either side, meet in the middle, half inch hole down the middle. I'm sorry. Uh, one inch hole down the middle and uh, from the edge of the door, chisel it in. You're good to go. It's not, it's not the, not the hardest thing in the world. So, so why did you leave the the private world and go? Cause now you work for a university, right? Is it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I work for a university of California and, uh, um, you got to miss Mon- the chaos a little bit, right? Uh, to now a point, I got locked out of my dorm room or something or, not or even, some professor. I mean, they've got RAs and desk staff for that. Um, so I work for housing specifically for the university. Really, it was money and benefits. Um, I worked at a mom and pop shop here for two months and then found out that um, 
the guys at the college were making almost triple what I was making at the mom and pop shop. Uh, really what it was is one of, a, one of the guys from that department had came in and got keys made for his Honda Civic and said, hey, we're hiring a locksmith if you know a guy. And I was like, yeah, I know myself. I'm a, I'm, I'm a guy. It's, I'm the guy. The guy is me. <laughs> yeah. I think I know myself, but, you know, it's a work in progress. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I went down and applied. I mean, I didn't go down and applied. I applied online. And, uh, yeah, the rest is history. Um, it was really money and benefits. I mean, we're union, which is great. Um, we're uh, local Teamsters 2010, which is awesome, which is really fun because my grandfather on my mother's side was a Teamster, really involved in the local, like, literal truck driving Teamster. Sure. So to be a Teamster now is pretty cool. Um, uh, but, yeah, it was really money and benefits. And, honestly, I'd kind of gotten tired of the chaos of it all, of, you know, just having to collect and nobody's ever happy to see you and constant attitude from everybody. And it, it's still kind of the same now it's just attitude from college kids, you know? Um, yeah, but you can just worse. blame them for being stupid, not assholes. There's that. And, and They're it's young and stupid, they, not grumpy old farts. Yeah, they pull an attitude with me, and I just, in my head, I'm like, I've literally been shot at. Like, this is not, <laughs> like, you have nothing on me. This is fine. That, that's, so, that's perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah that, that's perspective. You, know, yeah, you have no power here. Um, so, you, so the Teamsters Union, is there like a locksmith bar where all the locksmiths go to tell locksmith stories? No, 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 no. So there's, no. it's not like, it's not like IBEW, you know, they've got their own spots to hang out. You know, yeah. this is locksmiths are kind of the redheaded stepchild of like skilled trades. As far as like plumbers, electricians, carpenters, you know, that kind of thing. Um, that's the joke. They talk shit, man. Do the plumbers talk shit? I mean, if they yeah. do, I'll lock them out of their house. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, no, not really. I mean, I've never really had like inter trade drama. Um, right. But, uh, yeah, as far as working with the college, it was really just money and benefits, and it seemed like a chill job. It's it's honestly, as far as being a locksmith, aside from owning your own shop, this is kind of the top of the mountain is working um, work in uh, institutional for a, a large facility like this. I mean, that's kind of where the, where, what people are hoping to get to. And it comes with its own problems. And, but I do recognize, and I bitch about it a lot. Um, you know, my wife hears about it every day, but I'm not unaware of the fact that I've kind of, as far as my profession goes, I've kind of hit the lottery. You know, it's pretty chill. Um, yeah. Well, you know, you're a white hat locksmith you know you're doing the good thing there's got to be uh i'm just thinking in terms of like hackers it's like the digital guy who's trying to you know break through things is there locksmiths that have gone bad that you know of that have like gone rogue not, and that gone I, black not, hat? not necessarily in the breaking into houses and stealing stuff but more in the openly ripping people off way okay um, i know some of those um yeah but not yeah. like the you know all of a sudden they're in the federal reserve i'm just thinking of the i'm just thinking of the movie script that i would write of the locksmith who went bad and started breaking in the federal reserve uh i mean the temptation well, just because you're a locksmith day, doesn't so. mean you can dodge laser beams to get to a vault or something yeah i'm not gonna you know tom cruise my way through the laser beams <laughs> you know <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know uh, all right we're going off the, uh, off the rails a little bit but, dude i uh, sorry go go ahead i was gonna say i mean you know it's it's always there you know it's a fun it's a fun factoid to have in the back of your head of like walking down the street and like, you know, hippity hoppity. That could be my property. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it's a fun thing to have in your head, but it's another thing to act on it. You know, I mean, there's been jokey things of like my friend going out of town and like rearranging his whole living room, 90 degrees, you know, doing yeah. stuff like that, you know, you know, popping yeah. his door open. I mean, two friends went in and literally paintings and all rearranged his room, 90 degrees. And, you gotta uh, be careful what you find under people's sofa cushions, though, man. You gotta be, uh, you gotta be careful. You might find Aunt Betty's thing that she had in her lockbox. <laughs> I've seen one before. It's all right. So yeah, it's no big deal. Yours. Dan, thanks for coming to hang out with me, dude. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you. I, man. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity. This was fun. The uh, I, this was really easy. The imposter syndrome was real, so I appreciate it being uh, easy. So yeah, it's uh, it was good. It was fun to talk to you about this, and I think it's an interesting trade. And especially hearing from, you know, it's a trade that nobody ever wants to call a locksmith. It's not a call anybody wants to make, but it's yeah. good to know that uh, a locksmith, hey, they put their pants on in the morning, just like you. Again, you know? if you're lucky. Um. Again, if you're lucky, unless it's the uh, the pantsless uh, 
Dude, I, I think that's something, man. The past I'm, I'm going into I'm going into AI to see what a locksmithing truck would look like with uh with a half naked dude on the side. If I move awesome. That's all you need to know. It'd look awesome. Right now. Probably, probably <laughs> awesome. Uh, if, I, if I end up working back up in SF, I'll start doing that. I'll be the pantsless locksmith. I'll be the highest there you go. guy in the city. Huge success. <laughs> a lot of tips. All right, dude. Thanks for hanging out with me. Uh, Thanks again. Man. You have a good one. Be good. Yeah, you too. All right. <laughs>